Hello and welcome to today's session. So we continue reading the iconic American play by Edward Albee, titled The Zoo Story. We are halfway through reading the play and it's important to take a look at the historical context. So what has been happening in 1950s, in the 1950s in America. So politically and socially, uh, we can also see this in the play, very evident in the play. It was a very conservative community in terms of its preferences, in terms of its, its taste, its, ex, its expectations from uh, the society, from others. Yeah? We also find that, you know, in the persona of Peter, we find a character who is easily shocked. Yeah? There are certain neat expectations, naive expectations that he has from the, the, the world outside. So the ideal of the American dream was very popular. Uh, across all classes and this is also something that we have seen in the place uh, the other place that we have discussed how the American dream gave an opportunity for all individuals to aim for success aim for material success despite their backgrounds but we do find that you know it does not always work that way because uh, the, the divide in very visible ways continue to be there and the this possibility that anyone can achieve anything makes it more tragic yeah and that also makes people feel like personal failures because there are certain divides and a certain privileges which are always already there. It's an uneven, unequal uh, uh, race to begin with. And this promise of uh, egalitarianism, this promise of, uh, uh, you know, uh, which is held out to everyone, presumably in an equal way, uh, it, it also, you know, uh, makes them feel as if they are incompetent, that they don't fit in, which is something we saw spectacularly in um, in, in, in uh, Arthur Miller's place, where individual characters are made uh, to feel like failures, to they are uh, made to feel very inefficient. That helps them uh, in their functioning, not in the professional sense, but also in the way you know within their families they feel less, they feel like lesser men, they feel like um, less of a father, less of a family person, and that affects them to the point of you know leading them to take their own lives. So if we here find the a similar kind of thing happening, though in a slightly different way. Here also, you know, the person is driven to a point where he decides to bring an end to everything, including his own life. Yeah. So there is, a, and, and there, there's a way in which you know, in the 1950s, in this very conservative community, which is also you know, uh, facilitating the financial thriving of certain sections, there there is also this divide where people look down upon the ones who do not have the kind of financial security and material possessions which defined the American dream. So this play crit critiques that notion, those expectations, and those expectations which dehumanizes. Uh, certain sections of the society. So the character played by Peter, he represents the American dream, yeah, along with the material success that he reaps, which includes an apartment in a very posh side of the city in New York City. He is also, you know, he's complete with this perfect family. He's a wife, two daughters, and uh, two parakeets, two pets. And there is a, it's a typical nuclear family over here. He does not have to deal with intrusive neighbors. There's nothing that he need to worry about the world outside because it's also an American dream in some sense. It's also about keeping one's family secure, ensuring the security of the individual and the family. And, and by extension, you know, the, 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 uh, in a larger sense, the systemic belief was perhaps that, you know, each individual takes care of himself or herself and each family ensures its security. And by extension, it, it, it would, you know, promote the nation's uh, you know, security and the nation's financial uh, and contribute towards a nation's financial and material wealth as well. But we and one certainly knows that it does not happen that way. It does not operate that way in a practical sense. So this is uh, why, so which is why we find that uh, even in uh, Arthur Miller's place, yeah, there are these characters who are really trying very hard to make their family secure. But once they are derailed in some form, in an ideological sense, in a psychological sense, in an emotional sense, this also becomes a race to which they cannot get back to. So here, the, the play further com complicates this question of the this quest of the American dream by bringing in an alternate sexuality, an alternate preference, an alternate mode of living, which clearly does not fit in. So what about a person like Jerry, whose sexual preferences are different, whose uh, parents were adulterous in nature, who, who got orphaned at a very young age, who was raised within 
uh, very irresponsible circumstances within which you know a child should never be kept yeah how does one account for his race towards this american dream how would he a person like jerry reach his destination of the american dream yeah given that he is competing with uh, you know the likes of peter yeah whose life lives could be drawn out in this very neat uh, linear trajectory it fits within the heteronormative uh, system it also you know uh, does not challenge the world views it does not challenge the belief systems it's a perfectly drawn drawn out equation so it also needs to be remembered that even in 1952 yeah uh, the american psychiatric association had listed homosexuality as a form of mental disorder so here is an additional question of uh, uh, the the skewed way in which uh, body has been treated the preferences of the body were treated as as disorders uh it's not just about the economic divide just not about the class divide it's further deep down about the kind of preferences personal preferences which also are mapped onto uh the the larger equations of the society so the uh, which is why um, a character like jerry is also uh made to feel a lot of shame a lot of humiliation for being the way that he is so this anti establishment phenomena began to gain a lot of momentum socially politically and culturally in the 1950s it began to reflect in a massive way in the popular culture so which is why you know if you uh, read through the history of america the political and socio cultural history the 1950s marked the beginning of a lot of counteractive exercises you know a lot of counteractive movements against the conservative political climate in the us the conservative social climate in the us the, the, the social cultural climate in the us because this was also feeding in directly into the economic system that was uh, uh, you know getting promoted and they were all like you know constantly feeding into each other and the system in that sense was getting very suffocating for all those who wanted to do something slightly different who had alternate preferences alternate lifestyles so the beat generation for instance you know what a generate what was a group of writers a very young uh, set of uh, you know writers who protested against these conservative ideals and maybe in one of the uh, uh, maybe you know you can try and read up a bit more about the beat generation which you know had uh, uh, produced uh, poetry which is very radical in nature yeah so they were trying to you know find a medium through which the counter actions could be exercised in a very non violent way this was more like a cultural revolution so the films also began to be produced which idolized these anti hero figures like uh, james dean's uh, uh, rebel without a cause in 1956 uh, uh, yeah you know a 1956 production it was about a protagonist who challenged this conservative climate yeah so we find that when uh, edward alvey is writing and performing and staging up this uh, the zoo story it's also a favorable political climate it's a favorable political cli- favorable as in there are a lot of these movements and american drama is also trying to plug into these movements in some sense so um there this is also a time when we find you know as mentioned in one of the earlier sessions there's a this much that uh, the american drama seems to have uh, uh, have been drawing from the european conventions from the european traditions the absurdism being one of them so we find that the dramatic conventions are also being challenged absurdism and this entire uh, play this one act play where something very random happens in a park bench it's very surrealist in some sense it's a uh, very absurdist in some sense so we find that the, the this is being mimicked this is being replicated in very useful ways with an american theater as well because this was a convention this was a uh the the kind of uh, uh genre which was gaining a lot of popularity in different parts of uh, europe so just to give a, a background to this you know in between 1948 and 1953 these hinsey reports also came out where uh, the results of which shocked the nation because a lot of uh, uh american citizens contrary to popular belief admitted to their history of premarital sex and homosexuality which majorly challenged the notions the value systems that the 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 nation thought you know was inherent in it yeah so this deny this this uh, decay the 1950s also mark a movement from this denial towards this this acknowledgement that it is it need not be uh, neat it need not be you know linear and need not be perfect in the way you know the the american dream or the american society had uh, thought about things to be 
So uh, in the play also we find that um, Jerry is eager to share his homosexual experience, but that makes Peter extremely uncomfortable. Yeah? So um, as we move forward with this play, we will find that there are these major themes, there are these different themes which are being explored, such as loneliness, absurdity, existentialism, miscommunication, and majorly, you know, the criticism of the American dream, which is an overlapping feature across these different themes. So we'll just, uh, you know, try and address some of these. And I'm sure you also have now begun to see various instances, uh, uh, you know, fitting in perfectly with these uh, themes. So in uh, uh, this play, Jerry is presented as a representative feature from a certain class who also embodies loneliness. Yeah? And this loneliness is not something which caught up to him uh, during a certain phase in adulthood. It's not a result of any momentous event. This was something that he was growing up with. Yeah? His parents, you know, his father was also adulterous in nature. His father led a very irresponsible life. Yeah, we let him get to know. And uh, he was uh, orphaned at a very young age. And now he lives alone in a, an apartment. And the landlady is constantly fighting with him. And he's also trying to, uh, uh, further into the play, we'll find that you know, he's also trying desperately to connect with the dog, yeah? the non-human being because you know he has never been successful in forming a real connection with any real human being starting from his parents even in an intimate space we find that he has as a person as a human being he has been failed so there is nothing that he can relate to there's nothing uh, in peter's world that he can relate to the discomfort that peter faces yeah now it's it's and that's also could be entirely lost on a person like jerry because he grew up with the uh within a setting where even the notion of family was completely absent yeah so the perfection the world of perfection that peter inhabits also expects certain uh codes of behavior from uh people like jerry which unfortunately they cannot deliver due to the circumstances within which they are placed yeah so um and this loneliness is uh, this loneliness you know takes a very uh, tragic form too when he talks about those two empty photo frames and there are two empty photo frames but there are no pictures of anyone to put in them and these are certain objects certain images which are entirely taken for granted in the world that peter inhabits yeah so from the very beginning from the very outset we find that you know many of the things which are part and parcel of the ordinariness that peter inhabits are luxuries are privileges when we look at it from the point of view of uh, uh, jerry and what makes this play more enduring in a sense is we find that even peter is a lonely being despite the world that he inhabits despite the rich and diverse world that he inhabits which has all material comforts too he too is uh lonely in some form or the other yeah and uh, right at the outset you know even jerry begins to have this uh, jerry begins to uh, you know call out this information from him that you know he has two daughters but he always wished for a son and that perhaps is not going to happen at all so while uh, Jerry can be vocal, Jerry can afford to be vocal about his loneliness, about the tragedy in his life. The uh, irony is that Peter, who, uh, who, who supposedly inhabits a more privileged situation, he cannot afford to be vocal about his loneliness. It would be seen as an aberration if he admits that he is lonely because that is not what is expected out of his stature, out of his character, out of the setting where he is placed yeah so this play in that sense explores many complex questions about identity about the expectations and limitations of different uh, identities and different social situations within which these uh, you know these identities are located so through this uh, notion of absurdity through the tool of absurdity this play manages to strike uh, at her you know uh, against the American dream and the rigid morality that also had uh, know, laid the foundations of American society, particularly in the 1950s. So um, now Martin Eslin, uh, who is the author of The Theatre of the Absurd, a very celebrated work in terms of the theoretical frameworks that one could use to read absurd drama, uh, he includes Edward Albee among the list of writers who can fit into The Theatre of the Absurd. So this is what he comments about Edward Albee, who is also incidentally the only American writer who um, finds himself in that list. Edward Albee comes into the category of the theater of the absurd precisely because his work attacks the very foundations of American optimism. 
And this is a very keen observation. This perhaps, you know, sums up what this play is entirely all about. It also perhaps, you know, this is an observation which could be extended to talk about the other plays that we have discussed as well. How it attacks the very foundations of American optimism. And we find that the American dream is largely about this utopian optimism where everything seems fine, not just, you know, the moment one decides to believe in oneself and the individual capacities are put to its fullest uh, uh, use, one is almost guaranteed, as per this utopian dream, one is guaranteed material and financial success uh, and uh, reputation and good wealth and uh, in, in almost permanent ways. But at the same time, one is also guaranteed satisfaction in the family front. Yeah? These two seem to be uh, complementing each other. It's almost like you, know, you, you, you go for the American dream with uh, believing in your capacity as an individual. And both these sides, the social financial security and the family security, everything will be taken care of, you know. And uh, this is the, uh, uh, this is, uh, you know, the foundations on which perhaps, you know, the nation's dreams were built. And of course, you know, one, uh, the critique also comes from the fact that there were a lot of outliers, many who lost their lives, you know, many who could not fit themselves into this uh, framework, which wasn't, um, ideologically uh, compatible to the worldviews of perhaps, you know, of the non-capitalist uh, attitudes. Yeah? And in this play, we will notice that the absurdism is largely located in the way Jerry speaks. Jerry is the embodiment of this dissatisfaction and this absurdism. He is the character who can afford to sound absurdist over here. Uh, because a character like Peter, he's very sorted. Yeah? He's... Uh, 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 he's placed in such ways that there are a lot of limitations in uh, his speech as well. He cannot sound as free as uh, Jerry sounds. So Jerry is a character who defines social, uh, defies social conventions. He even, you know, uh, he, he uh, does not, uh, there's, an, there's something very outlierish about him in terms of the quality of his social life. There are very few expectations from him and that also makes him uh, freer, you know, he's not, uh, even Peter does not expect him to stick to the conventions that he is used to otherwise socially, uh, which is why, you know, he um, uh, starts telling a lot of long and, un long and complicated stories, uh, which are of little relevance in a social setting, but it brings out the tragedy, it foregrounds the uh, tragedy, uh, given that, you know, he's sharing these very, very deeply private stories with a total stranger and for no reason, there's no trigger to this conversation. It's all very random. It's a randomness which accentuates the tragedy of this as well. And this absurdism, you know, the, the tragedy, in fact, you know, gets in some form, it uh, uh, becomes very matter of fact within this absurdist framework because he is, uh, in, in, in this one act play, what Jerry is being enabled to do by the author, by this uh, absurdist setting, he's being enabled to speak the truth. And this is a society which is afraid of the truth, yeah? Despite the way in which Peter is placed as a man, as a family person, as a uh, career-oriented, successful uh, New York-based uh, uh, American, we find that he is, the discomfort also comes from some fear. He's scared of not just speaking the truth. He's also scared of encountering truth from others because this um, utopian pessimism, uh, sorry, this utopian optimism on which the foundations of American society are laid, you know, particularly during that period in society, that also does not enable them to address certain kinds of fears, that does not enable them to, uh, you know, uh, acknowledge certain kinds of uh, uh, truth, certain kinds of uh, realities. So um, Jenny's personality, you know, these two characters, they are like chalk and cheese over here. And the absurdity, the level of absurdity also gets heightened because of the nature of this contrast, which, um, uh, you know, Jerry keeps doing this at the beginning of uh, every story, the every little uh, detail, uh, you know, he will graphically give details of uh, how absurdly located his own apartment is in contrast to the neat, tidy, organized way in which Peter's life could be described, you know, um, his wife two kids and two pets yeah so uh this with this we will 
bring this session to our close and we will take a look at the other relevant themes and also try and uh, wrap up the play in the next couple of sessions. Thank you for your time and I look forward to seeing you in the next session. Thank you.